The opening of Disneyland could have sunk the Knott family and their berry farm. Or, at least, that's what many worried, including Walter Knott himself. But the draw of tourists to Disney's park, paired with the explosion of automobile travel brought by the post-World War II economic boom and new interstate highway system, meant that Knott's Berry Farm thrived in the late 1950s. Sure, the Knott's weren't operating on the same level as Disney. They didn't have the money, the cadre of talented artists, or the in-house research and development wing of a wed enterprises. But that didn't matter so long as they could keep the doors open. It was in that spirit that Walter Knott changed his mind one day and sent his son, Russell, to see Wendell Bud hurled it. Walter Knott initially rejected Bud Hurlbut's offer to run a concession at the park in 1954, citing a hesitance to add anything to Ghost Town that wasn't authentic to, or at least evocative of, the park's 1850s time period. Except the inexplicable seal pond. But a few months before Disneyland opened the following year, it appeared Walter had changed his mind. At least... That's what Russell Knott said when he showed up at Hurlbut's Park asking about the 1896 carousel Bud was restoring. Bud went back to the farm to talk to Walter, and the two hashed out a deal. One previous sticking point had been Knott's insistence on a one concession per concessionaire rule, which seems to have been the case since Paul Swartz sold his stake in the picture gallery around 1944, the last time somebody had a stake in more than one concession. Bud Hurlbut was having none of that. He was already running his own park, something he couldn't do while also running a concession down at Knott's Berry Farm. So, without the ability to expand his operations at Knott's place, Hurlbut was out. Knott relented, saying, I guess some rules were made to be broken but he followed that up with a non-committal qualifier to Bud. Let's see how you do. With a handshake, Walter Knott hired the man that would keep his park within competitive distance of Disney's over the following decades. It probably goes without saying, but as it turned out, Hurlbut's merry-go-round concession did quite well. Situated out along La Palma Avenue within the loop of the Butterfield Stagecoach and the cable cars, right across from the petting zoo, it was the first traditional amusement ride to operate within the park. Over the next couple years, two more rides opened. One was a collection of replica Ford Model Ts, like the one Walter and Cordy drove down from Shandon to start the farm on this land in 1920. But these were stationary rides, basically glorified versions of the kind that sat outside of supermarkets at the time. The other was called Henry's Livery, located where the Peanuts headquarters gift shop sits today. Guests could freely drive the miniature cars around an oval track. Thus, when Walter Knott approached Bud Hurlbut one day, asking about his ideas for his second concession, Bud's answer of a car ride seemed odd. There were already two car rides in the park. But Hurlbut seemed confident in his idea, so Walter gave him the go-ahead, as long as he didn't disrupt any of the trees on the land not designated for the attraction. Working with Ed Morgan and Carl Bacon of Aero Development, the same Aero Development that made the Snow White and Mr. Toad rides over in Disneyland, Hurlbut sketched up the layout of his ride. Ed Morgan took down his ideas for the cars and got to work on those. Hurlbut decorated the track with scale model homes, tunnels, a waterfall, all while dodging around the trees Mr. Knott insisted he leave unharmed. As it turned out, the layout dodging around the trees made the ride quite fun, despite its slow speed. Opening in 1958, Hurlbut's merry-go-round little car ride was another success. 
Hurlbut had proved himself, and over the following year was granted permission to add one of his miniature trains and a rowboat ride around the new Knott's Lagoon, a six-acre pond across Beach Boulevard, where the main guest parking lot sits today. Hurlbut tried adding ducks, geese, and swans to the lagoon, but removed the latter two after Walter Knott raised concerns about how aggressive they were, with one of the geese coming up and biting Knott's leg while they discussed the issue. Geese suck, just saying. The lagoon attractions could never compete with the popularity of Ghost Town across the road, but it didn't matter. Hurlbut had not only gotten not to break his one concession rule, he'd gotten him to shatter it. As Walter Knott loosened his restrictions on ride concessions in his park, he doubled down on adding the kind of displays that got him started in the first place. From 1956 to 58, he added several. First up were 21 replicas of California's Spanish missions, built along the park's version of El Camino Real by artist Leon Davolo. While these were meant to be historic and educational, they also formed a barrier to guests wandering into the path of the Butterfield stagecoaches, a perennial problem as the park's crowds grew. The second addition was the Western Trails Museum, a collection of Western memorabilia and photographs curated by Morgan Spear, which the elderly Spear could no longer maintain. This is the attraction that gave Museum Lane its name. Further down, in the old Jim Jeffries barn, Another museum opened, Mott's Miniatures. Allegra and DeWitt Mott built and operated the collection of miniatures in Iowa, but when they moved to Southern California, Knott gave their collection a home and allowed them to expand their concession as their displays grew. As the 1950s came to a close, one part of the park still bugged Walter Knott, the empty arena from the Mark Smith Horse Show. They'd tried putting another animal show in the arena, called The Bewitched Village, which claimed to feature formerly human residents of the titular village that had been turned into animals. It was really just a fairly standard trained animal show, with the loose and frankly kind of silly narrative stringing together the different acts. It didn't last, and yet again, Walter's Folly sat empty, ten years after it opened. So one day, as Walter and Bud were walking through the park, Knott asked Hurlbut if he had any ideas for the spot. Knott emphasized that whatever went in there needed to be good. It was right next to Calico Square and the train station, the centrally located and most popular area in the park. Hurlbut said he didn't have an idea yet, but that he would come up with something. Bud Hurlbut's eventual pitch played right into Knott's soft spots. Walter and Cordelia turned 70 years old that winter. They'd seen the Old West die away to be replaced by the urban sprawl, traffic, and rush of modern Southern California. Also, back in 1951, Walter Knott bought the land around the old Calico mines out in the Mojave, where he worked after his farmstead failed. He had Paul von Kleben lead a team to restore the old ghost town using the same techniques they'd used on the farm's ghost town, and then donated the whole thing to the county as an historic park. So when Hurlbut came to Walter Knott with his idea to replace the horse show arena, calling it the Calico Mine Ride, he knew he was playing right into what the old man wanted to hear. But Hurlbut also had ambitions of his own. He wanted to prove he could make an attraction just as good as the Disney folks up the road. He'd already proven what he could do with one of their ride vehicles with his car ride. Now, he wanted to tackle a dark ride on par with those in Disney's park. He designed the ride to exist fully enclosed within a seven-story mountain, using the same forced perspective techniques Disney's designers used on Main Street USA to make his mountain look huge. The most innovative element of Hurlbut's design seems so simple, it's surprising no one had thought of it before. To keep the correct scale on the exterior's force perspective, he hid the loading area on the side of the station furthest from the park's paths, with a sloping roof line that made the station appear smaller from the outside. 
He added some vegetation to help break up the station's profile, hiding it from view even more. Putting the loading area on the back side like this meant that the queue had to wrap around underneath the ride's track and come up the other side of the station. This had the added benefit of hiding a portion of the line from view of the rest of the queue. The practical effect of this was that, while the line could look empty from the outside, once you rounded a corner, you saw that the queue actually continued much longer. This kind of hidden switchback queue has been a common design element in theme parks ever since. Inside the massive show building, the ride used miniature trains like the ones Hurlbut had been making for years, dressed to look like period minecarts. The exterior's forced perspective made the ride's miniature trains look larger than they actually were. Bud eventually had six small engines, pulling trains with space for 50 riders. The ride featured scenes of mining life, natural wonders, and even a big waterfall. It also passed outside for a moment near the top, giving riders a view from almost 60 feet up the mountain. But the two scenes that cemented the ride's legacy were the glory hole and the cavern room. The former acted as the ride's centerpiece, with the trains getting glimpses of the area throughout their journey, until they pass through along the top rim and get a full view of it. The room, 90 feet across and 65 feet tall, featured mechanical animated miners digging, loading mine carts, and cutting wooden braces for the shafts. The cavern room was designed to be extremely mysterious and beautiful and a little fantastical. Walter Nod objected that the room wasn't realistic, but Bud, having met with the man that discovered Carlsbad Caverns, claimed it was within the realm of possibility to allay the old man's concerns. Bud's old Kitty Park owner friend, Harry Suker, came in to help oversee the ride's construction. Hurlbut sold his ranch, his house, and his car to fund the ride, and he still ran out of money. He had to go to Walter and ask him to suspend the rent payments on his concessions for a bit so he could afford to finish the ride. Walter agreed. By the time it was finished, Bud spent almost $1.5 million on the ride. That would equate to nearly $16 million today. The ride opened in November 1960, shortly after the election of John F. Kennedy as the nation's youngest president. It was immediately popular. It took two years for Hurlbut to make back everything he spent on the ride, but he would run the concession for just over 23 years total before the park bought out his stake in all of his attractions. Walt Disney himself took a ride on the Calico Mine Ride and was very impressed, especially with the hidden queue, which he described as sneaky. The success of the Calico Mine Ride inspired Walter Knott to have even more confidence in Bud Hurlbut. He gave Bud the go-ahead to develop a South Seas Island boat tour attraction around an expanded lagoon across Beach Boulevard. Taking design cues from the Jungle Cruise over in Disneyland, the idea fizzled, but the island and boat paths were carved out by bulldozers, even though the area never held water. Determined to make it work, Hurlbut shifted the theme to that of fur trappers in the Pacific Northwest, but even this proved too expensive and the idea was abandoned, as was the land where it would go. In 1963, Bud debuted the park's riverboat, dubbed the Cordelia K. Mrs. Knott christened it in July of that year with a bottle of boysenberry juice. It was meant to ply the same waters as his tropical island ride, but instead, since that failed, it went in the original lagoon alongside his rowboat concession. Early the next year, John Holland, one of the workers on the stagecoach, opened a concession called the Overland Trail Ride in the abandoned trenches dug for Hurlbut's jungle boats. With animatronic animals, abandoned wagons, and a hunter's cabin, the ride was simple and suffered from being located across the busy highway from the rest of the park. It hung around for a few years before it was abandoned as well. The only attraction that survived in this piece of land were the Woodimals of Forest Morrow. Morrow was a septuagenarian from Illinois that carved tree trunks into weird anthropomorphized animals and other creatures. 
1964, Walter had hired Morrow to repair the ghost town's catawampus creature and was impressed by his work. Eventually, he gave Morrow the concession on Jungle Island. The resulting attraction bore some vague resemblance to Disney's Tom Sawyer Island with a network of interconnected wilderness trails peppered with playground equipment and Morrow's cursed woodmills figures. It was never popular or profitable, but it was fairly cheap to run and that meant it survived where the other rides planned for the spot failed. 1964 was also the year that Walter Knott embarked on the last major project he would oversee on the farm. After visiting Philadelphia the previous autumn, Walter decided to build an exact replica of Independence Hall for his park. At 75 years old and increasingly suffering the effects of Parkinson's disease, it seemed like now or never. He sent a team to study the building, taking photographs of every single detail. He sourced 140,000 historically accurate bricks and made sure paint samples were matched to every part of the original building. Bud Hurlbut was granted unprecedented up-close access to the Liberty Bell, including a small sample filing from the interior so that the exact metal composition could be replicated. Every detail, right down to the crack, was reproduced to Walter Knott's extreme demand for accuracy. It took almost two years but the replica of Independence Hall at Knott's Berry Farm finally opened on July 4th, 1966, exactly one decade before the U.S. Bicentennial. The gardens around the building were planted with red, white, and blue flowers. Young women dressed in colonial costumes gave tours of the building. When guests entered the Declaration Room, hidden speakers created the illusion that they were hearing the debates amongst the signers about the foundational document of American independence. From this point onwards, Walter Knott became less involved in the farm's business. He still lived in the family house he'd built out back in 1928 and walked around the park to visit employees and watch the guests. But he'd been a hard laborer for over 60 years at this point, ever since he was a 10-year-old boy planting peas on vacant lots in turn-of-the-century Pomona. He'd worked hard to support his family through two world wars, a Great Depression, and myriad other disruptions. He'd earned the right to slow down, take it easy, and enjoy the results of his decades of work. His youngest daughter, Marion, took over the operations of the Ghost Town Park, and Knott's Berry Farm entered a new era. Hey friends! Thanks for watching all the way to the end of this video. Here's a couple more you might like, and if you would, please hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up. It literally costs you nothing except a few seconds, and it truly helps us make more videos like this one. An extra special thanks go out to the people helping us over on Patreon. It's because of their support that you're seeing this video right now. If you want to help the channel out even more, head over to our Patreon and check it out. You can find it through a link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you have a great day.